I want to start out with a definition of what do we mean by the Arctic Circle and the Arctic region, because they're not the same thing. Um, we are, uh, the Arctic Circle is one of the five major lines of latitude that go around the globe. The one that goes around the center, of course, is called the equator. If you go south from the equator, you have the Tropic of Capricorn is the major divider. There are other lines of latitude, of course. And then the Antarctic Circle on the southern part of the globe. If you come north from the equator, you have the Tropic of Cancer, which we, we cross every time we leave from our home in Mexico driving up to Texas. You have the Tropic of Cancer, and then the northernmost of the major latitude lines is the Arctic Circle. Technically, the Arctic Circle is defined as the northernmost point at which the noon sun is just visible on the summer solstice, and the southernmost point at which the midnight sun is just visible at the June solstice. So it has to do with the relationship to visibility of the sun. That's why it's called the land of the midnight sun, because there's only uh, the, the uh, ability to see the sun in the winter and in the summer dictates what is the edge of the Arctic Circle. The Arctic Circle also is not static. Uh, because of the fact that tilt of the Earth varies based upon the, mo uh, the moon's effect on the oceans, then the Arctic Circle uh, is actually moving northward or drifting northward at a speed of about 15 meters per year. So it varies. It's not always exactly the same doesn't vary enough that you'd have a huge ability to tell the difference by eye unless you come back a lot of years later. But this is the Arctic Circle, and of course you can see down here, we are right about there. We are here, Norway. We will be crossing over the Arctic Circle and going all the way up to the North Cape, one of the northernmost ports of Norway. So we will be well in the Arctic Circle. But on the other hand, the Arctic region is not a circle. It varies considerably. This line is the Arctic region. It comes all the way down into the Bering Sea, and this is where we were um, as we came across the North Pacific a few months ago. Um, the Arctic Circle is here. It comes all the way down. The definition for the Arctic region is anywhere that is below 10 degrees centigrade or 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the warmest part of July. So it has to do with the temperature, and that varies based upon a number of different climatic factors. For instance, you will notice that almost none of Norway is in the Arctic region. The reason for that is they can thank Mexico, because the Gulf Stream that comes up from Mexico warms the whole west coast of Norway, which means that's why the we have such nice climate you know this time of year if we did not have the gulf stream then this area would probably be as they are over in the bering sea down uh, up into the arctic region and therefore we would never get a temperature warmer than 50 degrees so we can be grateful to mexico grateful to the gulf stream that uh, we have such temperate climate this is the reason that norway is able to do a lot of the things they're able to do that their ports don't freeze up in the winter time like they do in some other areas that are this far north toward the Arctic Circle, okay? So a little bit of definition there. When we talk about Arctic exploration, which is the title of this talk, it is any of the physical attempts that have been made to explore the Arctic region, and especially the attempts to get to the North Pole, the centermost, uh, northernmost part of the globe there. Now, magnetic north, because of the magnetic characteristics of the globe, are not exactly the same as true north. There are some variations. I'd love to be able to talk to the captain or some of the officers. Today, I noticed uh, he mentioned when we left the port, uh, was that yesterday, at Allison's? <laughs> it all runs together, right? Uh, how many naps can you take? He, uh, when we left Allison, he said we were going to be circling in order to be able to uh, to Recalibrate? What's the word I'm looking for? Calibrate. Calibrate. That's the word I was looking for. The, um, the compasses. Because when you get this far north, the difference in true north and magnetic north makes a difference. And so that, that was part of the process. Um, it's just one of the characteristics we have on our planet. There are no people who live in Antarctica. You know, the Antarctica is... Um, is coldest place in the world. I mean, they, they don't, bears don't even live there. 
But the Arctic does have human habitation. There are a number of places in the Arctic uh, region and even in the Arctic Circle further north that people live, although it is considered the least hospitable uh, human habitation place on the planet. Um, it is very, very difficult to live here, and yet there are people that do live. I mentioned when we talked about Norway, uh, it, it, what constituted Norway, we have Janmagen Island, we have the archipelago of the Svalbards, various areas that Norway and other countries have properties, and there are people who live there. Not a lot, but there are some people who live in those locations. Spitsbergen is a is a one of the islands, the largest of the islands in the Svalbard uh, archipelago. That's where they have the seed bulb. There are people who live there. Okay. Now the earliest testimony we have of any exploration into the Arctic is actually from a Greek sailor who recorded it. Uh, his travels in 325 BC. His name was Pythias. There were various uh, shipments that would come into Europe through the uh, what they called the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Gibraltar Straits, into the Mediterranean to bring tin. And he was curious as to finding out what the source of that tin was because he thought, if I can find out where it is, I can start importing it and make some money. So he went, he followed the instructions he'd been given out through the, uh, the Gibraltar Strait out of the Mediterranean. He turned north. Now, none of this was really known at that time to the Greek sailors and others. But he turned north. He uh, explored around the British islands. And, and then as he traveled further north, he came to a place that he heard about that was legendary called Thule. Thule is actually a, a real location now in Greenland, but that's not where he ended up. He talks about the fact that he uh, they came to curdled seas, which meant they, there was ice in the water, you know, chunks of ice. Um, they didn't have that in the Mediterranean. They had never seen that before. So he called it the curdled seas. He also has descriptions in his writings from 325 BC that seem to be um, descriptions of the Aurora Borealis, and also of the Midnight Sun. So there's a pretty strong belief that Pythias was the first one ever to go as far north as the Arctic Circle. He did not discover the source of tan. He ended up turning around and going back. But this is the first example that we have. They believe that he probably either located an area on the northern part of the Norwegian coast, perhaps the, the Shetland Islands, or further north than that. Yes? Excuse me, are you saying tin or what was he looking for? Tin, the metal tin. tin. Metal tin, okay. Yeah, tin was necessary for the making of bronze and various other yeah. things, so okay. it was very valuable. And would yes. it probably have come from England? Well, um, we don't know if it came from England. He didn't know where it came from, but the story was that it had come from far up north, and so as an adventurer and sailor, he went looking for it. But he was not successful in finding it. Okay. He did sail around the British Islands and this, you know, the Shetlands and various other places. But this is the earliest account we have from 325 BC of someone who very possibly did actually sail north to the Arctic Ocean. Now, then we have, of course, as you're aware, the Vikings. The Vikings from um, Norway and they discovered that the Faroe Islands, the Shetland Islands, the Faroe Islands, they discovered Iceland, they discovered Greenland, they went as far as North America, uh, the places around the year 1000 that they call Vinland, um, the Leif Erikson was there, we have evidence in Newfoundland at Lanso Meadows that they were located there. Uh, the discovery of Greenland happened in the 10th century when a it, uh, just amazed at all of these Vikings and how daring they were. Uh, he was trying to get to Iceland. He got in a terrible storm and got blown off course. So they just kept sailing until he found Greenland. And then he came back and told others about it. And Eric the Red, who was an outlaw, he'd been thrown out of Norway. He ended up getting thrown out of Iceland. He went to Greenland, established a colony there. But then five, almost 500 years later, 470 years or so later, there was the coming of the Little Ice Age, and it became uh, impossible for them really to grow crops and things in Greenland, and so they had to end up deserting it. But all of these places were found by the Vikings, and many of them, in terms of Greenland, um, the, 
the Arctic Circle goes through Iceland, so the northern part of it is uh, in the Arctic Circle, and then they also sailed all the way up around past where we're going to go and around the Kola Peninsula. This little thumb that sticks out there is called the Kola Peninsula. I'll mention that again in a few minutes because that was an area that the Russians settled and from which they did a lot of exploring uh, at the same time. By around 880, all of northern Norway, the Kola Peninsula, and what's called the White Sea had all been explored by the Vikings. And again, these guys would get in open boats um, and go places nobody had ever gone before and just say, hey, if we live, it'll be great, it'll be exciting. And if we don't, well, as long as we die an honorable death, we'll end up in Valhalla. So they were willing to take risks that nobody else was. Um, you'll also see, and this doesn't have anything to do with the Arctic, but the, the kinds of routes that they had coming down the rivers of Russia, the Volga, and the Dnieper, and others, down into the, the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. Uh, Vikings served as the Varangian guard, the personal bodyguard of the Sultan of um, the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they, we have evidence of them trading regularly, apparently in Baghdad. So they were everywhere, and they sailed into the frozen seas as well, so they were a big part of that. A major effect, it, something that a lot of people, that I don't think many of us think about, is at various times in history, we have actually taken steps backward in terms of our, our knowledge of things. Um, mathematics, for instance, the Arabians, the Indian uh, peoples, had created the, what we call, uh, Arabic numerals, you know, one, two, three, four, five, that, the way we write them, and then the Arabic peoples had picked them up and had really made huge advances during the golden age of the Muslim world, and in Western Europe they were still using Roman numerals. All of that, when the Muslims got driven out of Western Europe, out of the Iberian Peninsula, the, they rediscovered all those things that had been forgotten. All of Greek philosophy had been lost during the Dark Ages. Uh, a lot of science and mathematics had been lost in Western Europe during the Dark Ages, and they had to rediscover a lot of that from the Muslim libraries that were left behind. Uh, the challenge I often give people when I talk about the importance of Arabic numerals, the base 10 numerals that we use, take four Roman numerals, right? You remember Roman numerals? X, I, I, all that kind of stuff. Write them down and try to add them up. It's not possible. That's the, that's the crudest kind of limitation that all of the numbering system had in Western Europe before we rediscovered Arabic numerals after the Muslims were driven out of the Iberian Peninsula. A similar kind of thing is that the, um, the Romans to some extent, but especially the Greeks, ended up with much more sophisticated navigation than they had in Western Europe for hundreds and hundreds of years. In 1409, Ptolemy, who had lived a long time before, he had written a book called Geographica in which he had introduced the concepts of longitude and latitude, the things we take for granted because they're on every map you pick up. But the Western world, the Western Europe, had forgotten, they had lost the idea of navigation by longitude and latitude. In 1409, they translated, finally, Ptolemy's book Geographica into Latin so that they could read it in Western Europe. This revolutionized exploration because all of a sudden they had the concept of a grid that you could follow to get from place to place and that was linked to the stars and various other things. So Western Europe entered into the exploration age in the 1400s because of this translation of a book that had been written hundreds of years before that. Um, there, prior to this time, there were a number of things that limited the exploration of the cold north. And that was, one, they had no technology for, um, for moving, you know, the ships. Uh, the, the idea of being becalmed in a frozen sea was not very attractive. They didn't have motors, of course, and so there were technical limitations. Technical limitations on the ability of their ships. The Vikings sort of uh, broke through on that in some. They, had, they didn't have any way to have stable food supplies. A lot of them died from scurvy because of not having food that gave them vitamin C or food that, that could be taken a long distance and would not rot or go bad. So that was a problem. And all, the, one of the biggest ones was they had no way to insulate against the cold. They, couldn't, they didn't know how to insulate their ships, nor did they know how to wear insulated clothing. 
It wasn't until the 20th century when Roald Amundsen, who I'll talk about, uh, who was the first person to uh, complete the Northwest Passage, he was the first person to visit both poles, he is, by the way, a Norwegian, um, he, he visited the North Pole and the South Pole, but one of the reasons he was able to do all of that is because for two winters, he spent when he was trying to do the Northwest Passage route across Canada from the Atlantic to the Pacific, he ended up living with one of the Inuit tribes. And they understood that the, everybody before that, particularly all the British, uh, the, the European explorers and the British sort of led the way on some of that, they would wear wool. They would wear heavy wool clothing, which even though wool keeps heat better than cotton or some other things when it gets wet, that wasn't nearly sufficient, and Roald Amundsen was the first one to learn from the Inuit peoples, the Eskimo peoples, if you will, that um, you could wear animal skins. They would wear two, two layers of animal skin. One with the inside would have the fur on the inside, then an outside layer with the fur on the outside, and that insulated far better than anything else they had. He also learned to use dog sleds which nobody had done before. And so all of that was part of what was necessary going back to old technology to enable them to do the exploring. Yes? Where did Streethoff Nansen come in? What's that? Where did Nansen come in in his education, in Amundsen's education? Um, I really don't know. I can't answer that question. I mean, he... Um, well, but let's talk later. Okay, please, I would love to. Yeah, I don't, I don't claim to know everything about all the explorers. So, um, but this 14th, in the 1400s is when they really had significant advances from uh, all of these things. They began to develop ways to insulate better. They began to develop more stable foods. Um, they began to make it possible, although they weren't there yet. That didn't come until much later. In the Renaissance, they did begin to explore the southern edges of the Arctic Circle, um, and some of that was because they had the ability using Ptolemy's work and some others from that point. I mentioned the Kola Peninsula. Now, you're going to have to sort of stand on your head in order to look at this map, because it depends on the perspective. This is Norway, okay? We're somewhere in here. Uh, Sweden, Finland, Russia, etc. This is the Kola Peninsula that I mentioned that sticks out from, you know, it's part of Russia. It sticks out from the, the north of, northeastern part of Finland. In 1533, again, they had just 100 years or so before that really began to, to explore more. But by 1533, Russian monks went to the Kola Peninsula and they established a monastery there, the Pachanga Monastery on the Kola Peninsula. Um, and created a community, a group of Russians called the Pomars. The Pomars were a very sea-oriented group from Russia. The Pomars settled there, and they began exploring throughout the entire Barents Sea region, which is up in here. They explored the coastline. This, all of this is, is uh, Russia over in, in here, of course. They were. Um, Finding other locations, part of it was, uh, well, almost all of it was kind of economically driven. Most of the efforts to get from the east to the west or the west to the east had been driven by the desire to have trade. The Pomars were very trade driven, very trade oriented, and so they pursued a lot of that. They discovered uh, Spitsbergen in the Svalbard archipelago, they discovered Noya Zimla and some of the other locations that later on became fairly significant cities. Murmansk, for instance, is right in here, okay, and Archangel and other of the cities that became um, fairly significant trading cities for the Russians. So they continued to trade and settle various areas along that coast um, in the 1500s and following that. And by the 1700s, they had developed regular trade routes that connected the um, Archangel, one of the cities up here, across the north. This is called the Northeast Passage. If you're from Canada or the US, you probably think you have heard a lot about the Northwest Passage. Interestingly enough, the Northwest Passage, which for many, many years, even though they had made it, it was not really passable. Now it is. The global warming means that a lot of the ice has melted. They now take cruise ships in there. When I did this talk on the, in the Pacific, coming back from Japan, there were several people who had been on a cruise ship that made 
the, the trip of the Northwest Passage from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean over the top of Canada. Well, this was called the Northeast Passage, and it actually was investigated significantly before even the uh, Northwest Passage was. This is what it looks like. Again, here is Norway. This is a little bit more up, right side up for you. Murmansk, Archangel, various other places here. Uh, this is the Kola Peninsula there. And the Northwest Passage is the passage that goes along in the Arctic Sea. Um, now, in Russia, they have what's called the Northern Sea Route. The Northern Sea Route goes from the Bering Sea over to um, Russian cities, Murmansk and Archangel. They don't include the, the leg that comes down into the Atlantic. So they go from the Pacific to Russian cities. So the, that's called the Northern Sea Route in Russia. The, the North, Northeast Passage is the whole thing. It includes the Northeast Sea Route, and then it comes down into these areas, to Iceland, the Faroe Islands, down into the, the North Sea. So they have been using that trade route um, they began in the 1500s. So that route from the Atlantic to the Pacific, uh, around Norway and around Russia, has been actively used. Now, the problem they have with it is it's really only it, in the past, it went through a period of time because it got colder, and now it's getting warmer again, but when it got colder, there were only a couple of months a year when that was really open. Uh, about 10 months of the year, you were in danger of being iced in, and so they couldn't use it year-round, but they did have regular traffic going through there. Um, this is a very old map that was created. You, you see here, um, the, this is Dutch, the New Land, which is Spitsbergen and part of the Svalbard, uh, Svalbard Peninsula. Down here you have uh, Finland and Norway. So they're just suggestions of things because they had not explored all of the different coastlines. But this route over Europe and over Asia, from Norway to, to Russia, um, was economically motivated. Attempts began in the early 1500s, but again, they discovered that it was only two months of the year after a while that they were guaranteed to be able to make that. In the mid-16th century, Various of the British had been trying to make this Northeast Passage work for them. Um, they, some of them were shipwrecked, a number of the different crews died of scurvy, they would be uh, locked in ice. A few made it and they promoted the idea of Russian-British trade from that, but it became so difficult that there also were Danish and Dutch explorers that were trying to do this, but it became more difficult because Russia ended up closing this Northeast Passage because they were afraid that particularly the Dutch and the English, who were major sea powers, would begin to settle in Siberia. And they would become a challenge to the Russian possessions. And so they began to cut that off. In the 17th century, Cossacks, you know, very tough, they began exploring these regions um, and they proved that there was no land connection between Asia and North America. For a long time they had thought that there was a contiguous land connection. There was a land bridge that still existed. Of course the belief is that uh, at one time, in ancient times, there was a land bridge. That that's how people um, got from one continent to another and then those land bridges went away. Well the Cossacks in the 17th century proved that that didn't exist anymore because uh, they were the first ones to explore all of that. 1728, Vitus Bering, you know the name Bering, the Bering Sea and the Bering Straits. Uh, he goes, he went east to west. He actually was Danish, but he was employed by the Russians. He went east to west along this and named the Bering Sea and the Bering Straits. And then there were, in the 1800s, Finnish, uh, who completed the this Northeast Passage, so a lot of back and forth. This, of course, is the Northwest Passage. We have Alaska, the U.S. down here, Canada. These were the various ways in which the Northwest Passage was attempted. We have various people like, um, in 1564, Jacques Cartier discovered the mouth of the St. Lawrence River while trying to find the Northwest Passage. Um, in uh, 1576, Martin Frobisher, who was British, made three trips into the Canadian Arctic looking for this and ended up establishing a number of different trading ports. John Davis was an Englishman in the 1580s who attempted this. He said it was possible. In fact, he's one 
he got far enough that he could see, you know, he landed on Banks Island and he could see Melville Island from there, which had he been able to get through the ice at that point, would have made it possible for him to continue on. But that he wrote uh, in his records, his annals of his trip, that it definitely was possible. And he inspired other people to try, like Henry Hudson. Henry Hudson, of course, ended up uh, naming Hudson Bay and the Hudson River. And later on, there was the, you know, the Hudson Bay Trading Company, which became very important. Unfortunately, too many of the people who tried this ended up like this, stuck in the ice and ended up uh, dying from starvation, from, uh, from various other things, disease, uh, which people are inclined to when, they, when they're malnourished. Uh, so this was the danger that they faced. Um, in 1851, Sir Robert McClure confirmed the ability to go through on the Northwest Passage, and as I say, because of various uh, global warming factors, it's now possible to do that in a way that it wasn't. Some of the people that eventually made the process, they would go part way by ship and then offload dog sleds. They'd go part of the way by dog sleds and they met by other ships, and so they managed to do it in legs. Being in Norway, we have to talk about Roald Amundsen. Roald Amundsen is perhaps the greatest of the modern explorers. Uh, in 1906, he actually started in um, the, well, in 1906, he completed the Northwest Passage. It took him three years, so he started in 1903. He took three years. He outfitted a 47-ton herring boat called the Gioa to uh, make the trip. Took three years to do it. Two of the winters he spent with the Inuits, and that's where he learned to wear fur clothing rather than wool, where he learned to use dog sleds and that sort of thing. And that allowed him to be the first person to reach both poles the first person to complete the Northwest Passage uh, entirely by ship, you know, without, in this case, without getting off and using, but that's why it took him three years to do it, because he would reach a place and have to wait until uh, the season changed so that the ice would be available to him. He, um, the, the Northwest Passage trip that he made, he went from east to west, and he got to Nome, Alaska, which means he had completed the route, he landed in Nome, Alaska, and he wanted to send word back that he, he made it back to, to uh, Norway, but he had to go to the nearest telegraph. Well, the nearest telegraph was in the town of Eagle, Alaska, which was 500 miles away. So he walked. He walked from Nome, Alaska to Eagle, Alaska, 500 miles in order to send a telegram, and then he walked back. Um, so I think they were tougher back then. You know, I remember the comedian who said, you know, my dad worked two jobs and went to school at night. Me, if I go to the bank and the dry cleaner on the same day, I gotta take a nap. <laughs> well, it's sort of like comparing ourselves to people like Roald Amundsen. Um, 1910 to 1913, he reached the South Pole 33 days before the Robert Scott expedition um, by using dog sleds, the things that he had learned from the Inuit Indians, uh, Inuit, Inuit natives. He, in 1918, completed the Northeast Passage from, you know, from over Norway and Russia from sea to sea. In 1925, um, he traveled by plane over the North Pole. There was some question of that it's believed that that was the first time people actually saw the North Pole, um, that they could affirm it, and that they just flew over it. They almost had a disaster. The plane crashed. They were crashed for six weeks. For six weeks, he and the others that were with him on this plane, um, in order to try to get the plane out of the ice that it landed in, they were living on 400 grams of food a day. They ended up over six weeks moving 600 tons of ice and managed to get the plane off the ground again to make it home. Um, in 1926, he flew over the North Pole in an airship, and then in 1938, he was actually in an airplane trying to help rescue others who had gone down in an airship over the North Pole. The airship Italia had crashed, and Roald Amundsen and, and his air, airplane crew uh, crashed somewhere. They never did find them, and so they were killed that way. But Roald Amundsen was definitely one of the major explorers. Interestingly, when he left Norway with this herring boat, the Gioa, that he had outfitted, um, he was just a few hours ahead of the people that were going to stop him because he owed them money. Uh, they, they were going to cut off the trip, and he was just ahead of them. 
And so I think one of the reasons he was so anxious to get to an, a telegraph when he finished three years later to send word back that he'd made it is to, you know, sort of to say, neener, neener, you know. Uh, <laughs> we actually did it, even though you all didn't want us to go. We then have another major character is uh, U.S. Uh, Rear Admiral Robert Peary. In 1909, Peary claimed to be the first person to reach the North Pole. It is very controversial. Um, he used dog sleds. He had several support teams. He sort of did it in legs. Many people have claimed that it is not possible for him to have accomplished what he did. When he arrived at the North Pole, he was the only one of his group that had the navigational ability to affirm that, yes, we, this is where we were headed for. This is the North Pole. Nobody else could confirm it. Um, professional skiers using skis and dog sleds tried to reproduce his trip and claimed it was not possible because he said that he traveled um, 304 miles in seven days across an area that had ice you know, ravines and various other things. But he said this last rush, uh, that he made it there, um, he had already won a number of awards in Greenland, that the furthest north award, he'd gone further north than anyone else in 1902. Um, and so he, there was always a question. He was being sponsored by the National Geographic Society. National Geographic Society would not allow anyone else to examine his the data that he brought back. Um, they kept it secret, and some very powerful people made sure that nobody else interfered with that. And so there has always been a controversy over whether or not Peary really did make it to the pole or not. Um, he was an interesting guy in many ways. He was married uh, in 1888, but in 23 years of marriage, he only spent three years with his wife. Because he was always out doing something else. Uh, exploring, trying to, um, and he was, he was very big on getting credit for this stuff. The during that time, though, he wasn't lonely. He had a relationship with an Inuit woman named Ala Pasina, and they had two children together. So he found other things to do rather than just, you know, ride dog sleds. Um, the um, there was a lawsuit that he sued Frederick Cook, who claimed that he had not actually made it. That these, I mean, this was a big deal. People's careers were made or broken by whether or not they succeeded in this stuff. And so there often were lawsuits. There were claims of, yes, you did, no, you didn't, uh, kind of stuff. There was all sorts of difference. Today, there are still serious questions about whether or not Perry made it. And by the way, this, this gentleman was his, he called him his first man. Uh, this fellow's name is Matthew Henson. He had met him in a haberdashery. He was working in a clothing shop in London. They hit it off, and Perry invited him to come exploring with it. And so he ended up being the right-hand man to Perry throughout all of his explorations. Um, so, but he, previous to that, um, had worked in clothing. So I guess that explains the beautiful fur. Um, <laughs> the, Different people, this is a picture of Perry um, at what he claimed was the North Pole. Some people believe that Perry just made an honest mistake, that he really did think he was there. Some people believe that uh, it was fraud, that he knew he didn't make it, because again, professional Olympic skiers, people who won Olympic medals, tried to reproduce what he said he had done on skis and were not able to do it uh, by a long shot. And so the um, it's possible that he did not intentionally defraud the people that he made this claim to, but we'll never know, perhaps, uh, whether he did or not. This is an image um, of looking over at Spitsbergen. This is the largest island of the Svalbard uh, Berg archipelago. This is the island on which is the sea vault that I showed you when we talked about Norway. Um, looks like a cozy place, doesn't it? <laughs> So this is, this is what people are willing to, to go through uh, to explore. The, there are a lot of other explorers. On August 3rd of 1858, the American submarine, the USS Nautilus, as part of the Cold War kind of exercises, went underneath the North Pole, completely across, without surfacing. And then later on, another submarine, the USS State in 59, did surface at the North Pole. Um, we have Ralph Place said in 68 he reached the North Pole via snowmobile, and everybody's always trying to sort of twist the way they do this in order to make a new record. He made it by snowmobile as the first surface traveler known 
proven to have done so. In um, 1969, Wally Herbert, using only foot power and dog sleds, became the first person to reach the North Pole on muscle power alone, as opposed to, uh, to motorized. And then the first persons to reach the North Pole only on foot, without the use of dogs or sleds or anything else, were um, an, a Canadian, Richard Weber, and a Russian, Mishka Malikov, uh, in 1995, and nobody else has completed that journey since then in terms of entirely on human power without any assistance outside that. Um, we've had a number of people who've landed planes there. Interestingly, you all know the TV show Top Gear? You know Top Gear? It's these guys who are, are huge motor nuts, you know, all different. They drive all kinds of different cars and, and, and whatnot. They actually outfitted a 1996 Toyota Hilux pickup truck and drove it to with it to the magnetic North Pole, which was not quite the true North Pole, but they drove it up there. Later on, a group of Russians in 2009 outfitted two Russian-built automobiles and drove 38 days over 2,000 kilometers and got to the North Pole. So mechanization has made it a little bit easier. But this is all the efforts that have been made to explore. You know, they say that other than the deepest parts of the ocean, there aren't any more places that haven't been discovered. But then every once in a while, they'll find some place in the desert, with, or I'm sorry, in the jungle, where they will identify some people group. I read an article just a couple of weeks ago about a new people group they found in, in jungle areas. So there are still unexplored places. But, um, the coldest areas of the world people have been to, but I'm sure they'll keep trying to get there. You know, there may be the first person to reach the North Pole on crutches, or the first person <laughs> to reach the North Pole without ever standing upright. I, they'll keep trying different things. Questions about any of that? I, I want to finish early because at, uh, at a quarter chill, we've got Maria coming in to talk about uh, various opportunities for future cruises. Questions about Arctic exploration? Yes. The, well, it changes. Um, the I actually have the position of true north, uh, or I'm sorry, of magnetic north is 78 degrees 35 minute 35.7 minutes uh, north and 104 degrees 11.9 degrees um, west. So it wouldn't be too far off that, but I'm not exactly sure what. Yes. Um, my understanding is that we couldn't use the longitude to get position until they could get a portable. Exactly. That's true. So, during the Greek time, uh, Pythias used longitude. How could he have used it? Well, yeah, I don't think Pythias even, he was before Ptolemy, so I don't think he even he had. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, longitude, to make longitude work, it's necessary to have a clock that will operate at sea. Um, in fact, there are books that have been written about the, the, discover, the invention of chronographs that you could use on the ocean, because previous to that, they wouldn't work. Um, the longitude and latitude that had been outlined were static lines, and the, so they were never exactly sure prior to the ability to have chronographs that worked on the sea, but they could have some sense, and mostly they were tied to landmarkings. You know, when you see that island, then you'll know that you're at this, at this longitude. So much of it was landmark based prior to the invention of a clock that would work on the water. So it wasn't exact, but just having a grid system that gave you some idea how that was overlaid on various islands and land masses and whatnot gave them phenomenally more accurate uh, navigational capabilities than they had before. But you're correct. Until they could actually invent a clock that worked at sea, I'm not even exactly sure why a clock doesn't work at sea if it doesn't, you know, but. Prior to that, they didn't have one. And so, what's the name of the book? There's a book that's about that exact thing. Oh, the yeah, it, the the clock. Perhaps that's it, the accuracy, yeah. It invented a winding system that was accurate. That was the problem. Okay, so it had to have a winding system that was accurate. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, I read a book years ago called Cook and Perry. And one of the reasons Cook disputed Perry's claim was that he, he claimed he had his own claim. And he claimed the reason he could tell was he could stick a stick in the ground and you know, the shadow didn't change yeah. over a 24 hour period. Yeah, there was no shadow. He had to be directly north. Yeah, um, yeah and they, they sued one another and Perry won. Um, so uh, Cook was discounted in the lawsuit 
but it was an issue over who actually got there. And there, again, this was a huge deal. This this made or broke careers. You know, Perry was promoted in the in the Navy, even though I think he was a reservist at that point, um, and received all sorts of financial benefits. It was a big deal if you could if you could legitimately make a claim that you had discovered something like this. Other questions? Anyone? Well, thank you very. Oh yes, Chuck. Ah. Uh, one of the things that I learned years ago, and I've forgotten a lot of the details, was that in order to get to the North Pole, if you're there, just think about it, the only direction you can go is what? South. Uh, South. South, yeah. Well, we fixed that problem on the inertial navigation system by changing the way the world's grid works, and we put the North Pole down at the equator, and therefore we could get to the North Pole where it really was. Okay. Wow. If you heard that, this is Chuck Berry. He's a navigator on submarines. Of course, you can't use landmarks if you're on a submarine. So, because of the fact that there's a problem, the true North Pole, it, there's no place to go from South, and so it's very hard to navigate. So he was just saying what they did was they took the globe and they sort of turned it on its side, so the North Pole was being read as, as though we're on the equator, so that they then could could do navigation with it. It gets very complicated up there.